The first thing I was going to talk about, sort of chapter one, is Toronto's status quo in terms of this Sidewalk Toronto project, but also smart cities in general, and maybe what we're talking about. Um, is everybody here familiar with the Sidewalk Toronto project? Yeah, I'm just going to say a couple things, because I think some things have been a bit confused. Uh, the Sidewalk Toronto project is a venture that's happening between Waterfront Toronto, which is a tripartite government agency, so it's got people um, elected, not elect, not at all elected, <laughs> appointed to its board, uh, three from the feds, three from the province, and three from the city. And there's one elected official on that entire agency, and that agency is tasked with developing this about over 800 acres of um, real estate called the Portlands, right? So that's Waterfront Toronto. And there's a joint venture now with Sidewalk Labs, which is a subsidiary of, um, of Alphabet, and it's a sister company to Google, right? So these two have come together to do this project. Uh, no land has changed hands. I think that's one thing that got really misreported. So nobody, there is no land that has changed hands. Sidewalk Labs, Google, is they don't have any right to any land right now. Um, and they are investing up to $50 million over the course of the next year, US, uh, to create a plan. So the output right now, the deliverable, that is going to cost up to $50 million, this investment is a plan. That's it. It's called a Master Innovation and Development Plan. Is that all pretty clear? Yeah? Okay. So a lot of this is just about planning and exploring and sort of this is a, we're at this early, early stages of this idea. Um, so some of the things I think that um, are relevant particularly to the Sidewalk Toronto uh, conversation, <laughs> one of the things is that uh, it has forced a discussion whether we like it or not. There are issues that we have to grapple with because whether it's Sidewalk Labs or many other companies, some of these things we're going to have to deal with, right? So whether we like it or not that it's here, it's, it is good because we have to figure this stuff out. Um, the only thing I'll say about sort of, uh, I think the one thing I am not very flexible on is uh, the need for whatever we decide to do to be an informed decision um, on behalf of the residents of the City of Toronto. And it's probably my biggest concern is do we have adequate time and capacity to understand what we're getting into? And I think that for me from a process perspective is one of the biggest issues with this, with this whole project. Um, a governance vacuum, this is a thing I, uh, that I think is, is a <laughs> pretty big concern. We, in terms of the policies and laws that we have to manage technology in our cities, they're basically either out of date or they don't exist. And so this is what can be considered a governance vacuum. And the problem with a governance vacuum is that then what we start to do just becomes what is normal and that becomes how we operate in a space. Um, this, I've been referring a lot back to, to an essay that was written by Lawrence Lessig in 1999 called Code is Law. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a bit of an extension of that idea and it's not a perfect thing, but the idea is that, you know, uh, when you don't have policies or laws, the ways that we operate with technology sort of become de facto law. Not law, law, proper law, but like it's just sort of the way that we operate becomes normal. So we sort of develop these norms and technology does that um, in an interesting way because of the internet because people can go straight to you, you know? You don't have to be regulated necessarily to have a product reach people. So this is an interesting quirk of sort of um, internet days. And the last thing about, it, about this deal, which I kind of find particularly challenging, is we have that agency that we talked about with only one elected representative on it. And then we have this structure. So we've got someone who's both an investor and so being kind of discussed as a partner, but they're also going to be a future vendor. And so one sticking point for me that I find particularly troubling is making policy on the fly with a vendor. It's bad enough to be making policy on the fly, but now you're making it in partnership with someone who may be selling you products and services, right? So there's something in there that from a process perspective, it's not an ideal linear path, but here we are. Um, a few more things about the City of Toronto. Uh, Tracy Lorio mentioned in a piece recently, um, we have smart, some smart city technology. We do have sensors. Uh, we do have, um, so we have some, uh, some tests going on right now with uh, sensors to monitor traffic on the King Street, um, that sort of King Street pilot. There's other places, you know, there, there is tech in the city that would be considered smart city tech. So 
it's not like there's none and this is the first thing that has ever happened in the city, but I think it might be helpful at this point in time to understand what, what we're already into. That might be a nice inventory. Um, we do not have a smart city policy. So as mentioned, we have a task force. The city's had a task force for almost, I think, two years now, which is, a, it's run through the Toronto Board of Trade. So there are definitely conversations going on around how this might happen or how to maybe use technology in the city. But um, my read on a lot of this, whether it's at the city level, the provincial, federal, I mean globally, it's not just Toronto, is that there's a fear on behalf of elected leadership to put policy in place. Because there's this sort of thing right now of like, mm, we don't want to do the wrong way, we don't want to hold back innovation, we don't want to stifle anything, tech is great, jobs will come. So there's a lot of enthusiasm and it also feels like there is some fear on behalf of people who are the elected leaders to sort of say, okay, hold on, we need to sort of be in charge of this stuff. Um, so I do think that there's a bit of an opportunity here for residents to let elected leaders know, like, you know, we have some concerns and we'd like to understand how those are being addressed from a governance perspective. Because there's also a lot of enthusiasm, which is great. You know, that, that should be here as well. But how do we uh, sort of balance these two things? And the last thing here that I always think about is we have democratically informed policy. In an ideal world, technology would be used to support that policy, right? So one of the other things I'm finding challenging about the narrative with this project is that now it's got its own set of characteristics or reasons to exist but they're not really being tied into existing policy that the city of Toronto has. So that's just sort of the, that's, I don't know, high level what's going on with the city of Toronto. Um, so <coughs> sort of two terms here. Uh, one of them, in terms of sort of talking about this issue a little more broadly, is the digital consensus. And I've been seeing this happen for a while. I've got a story to tell you about it, but um, it's sort of the idea that there's a perceived benefit and a neutrality to technocratic governance. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen these ideas of like cities getting more and more tech and they've got dashboards and they've got open data and they've got stuff you can share with, you know, share with the residents and, and it all sounds great uh, to a degree, um, but there seems to be this sort of implicit idea that, that upping your tech and data sort of capacity is going to lead to things that are beneficial and there's also something that's assumed that it's just neutral to be doing this, that this is just sort of a normal thing to do. So that's what I would consider digital consensus as a term. Um, political economy is important here because uh, smart cities were essentially invented by the technology sector. Smart cities didn't come up because governments were like, wow, how do we use technology? Vendors, please come and, you know, we got ideas, please, please make stuff for us. It was the other way around. It was the tech sector coming to cities being like, hey, let's do some, let's do some things. You want to buy some things? We got some things for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you start to buy products that were developed for you, not developed that you, not products that you developed, um, you are starting to impact how you deliver public service because people are selling you things that may play a role in maybe urban planning or maybe service delivery or maybe the way that you know emergency vehicles are routed or whatever. These are things that impact in the end of fact that how public service is delivered. So they're political purchases to my mind. Um, and so those two things together have some impacts that, I, <laughs> that are definitely ethical in nature. Uh, so this is a story I think that explains those two terms well together. Um, so how many people have sort of followed this conversation about the shelter crisis? Pretty much everybody here, yeah. Okay, so um, it's got an origin that's longer, I mean, it's probably much older than even the, the little piece of the story I'll tell you, but um, in 2000 and, between 2001 and 2003, uh, the city of Toronto overspent to the tune of about $850,000 on what, what the auditor found out in 2004 were empty beds. So in 2004, the city of Toronto's auditor went in and said, hey, uh, we wasted a lot of taxpayer money. There's $850,000 of, of empty hotel or motel rooms that weren't used. And you can imagine how well everybody would respond to that sort of um, a spending, you know, whatever we want to call that. Uh, and so what happened in light of that auditor's report was sort of um, a renewed focus on making sure money wasn't going to be wasted on sort of on, on shelter uh, for homeless people or for others who need it. And um, from that point, between, I don't know, then and about 2010, there was a software um, system that was developed 
cost about three million dollars. It started in the David Miller Times, like it came online in the Four Times. Um, and basically what that software did, and this is um, what software like this can do, it starts to make sure that you're being very efficient with what your what your shelter bed numbers are, right? And so what this software was, it was designed to say, here are how many we have, and at that point in time, there was also a set to say like 90% capacity is what we're aiming to have, like to make sure that it's interesting, not going over or under that, but that was about the right number to try to be aiming for, right, for like, for usage. Um, and what that does is when you start to focus in so tightly on those numbers, what you what you start to lose is the re, is sort of the reality that you need to have flex in systems, right? It's completely normal that you would have lots of empty beds because the only way you're going to make sure everybody who needs a bed has one is that you have empty beds, like that. That would be planned. And and what we know is beyond that 10% overage that was kind of permitted, that you had that little extra space. If you talk to people on the ground, they knew you needed a lot more than that 10%. And that 90% that capacity wasn't really capturing the reality of the story. And a lot of people weren't even going to the shelters. Um, so the point is here that when you build these systems that are really focused on specifics and numbers and kind of pointing yourself into these assumptions um, of the math that you have, you start to entrench this thing of scarcity. Like this is really a manufactured crisis because if anybody would have been talking to people who understood the numbers better, uh, this wouldn't, you know, this doesn't surprise anybody. But when you have a system that lets you say, no, it's okay, we're at 90%, everything's fine year after year, you build a system to kind of tell you what you want to hear. And that's what these systems can do. Because you can think that if you would build a system differently, which was to say, make sure that we have a lot of flex, you probably would have built different software. So the point is that when you build systems, you need to understand what's the problem you're trying to solve. And in this case, it didn't sound like the problem being solved was to make sure anybody at any time needed a bed, right? So I just think there's, you have to think about the impacts of starting to, to sort of zoom in on very specific numbers when you're designing systems that support public service delivery. And at the end of the day, this has also made sure we don't have conversations about housing. Now we just keep looking at this at this situation as a shelter number and make sure, okay, we're doing fine, we're doing fine, and it almost puts you off that main topic of the building housing, right? So these are all little pieces that suddenly together kind of put you off the track of actually solving the problem. Um, so sort of given that that was in about 2010, um, let's fast forward to 2014. This is a program called What Works Cities. This is Bloomberg Philanthropies. Anybody heard of this program? Yeah. So Bloomberg, uh, Michael Bloomberg, formerly of New York, um, he, well, I guess he's still there, but mayor, uh, he has been spending a lot of money um, helping cities get up to speed with their digital infrastructure. And so if you read the language here, you know, um, all cities, you know, cities come in all shapes and sizes, but they share the same mission to serve residents in the most effective ways possible. Um, there's a big part of the mandate here is to build things and then have them scale. The point is that there's, there's a consent, again, this consensus that we should be building all of these systems and that monitoring and using data to inform governance is the way, right? So the fact that left-leaning, right-leaning cities, anybody, everybody's getting money and everybody's sort of investing in this thing. So this isn't something that's got a, a partisan flavor to it necessarily. It's just, again, this is a sort of technocratic approach. Um, yeah. This is a sign. <laughs> this is a sign. Uh, that, I, that I know, I think this is coming out of New Orleans, um, but I'm gonna read this to you, and it just says, because there's another word that you hear a lot right now related to this project, it's resilience. So the sign says, stop calling me resilient, because every time you say, oh, they're resilient, that means you can do something else to me. I'm not resilient. Um, and I think it's interesting that resilience has become a normal word to describe what we're trying to figure out in cities. And again, I think if you start to put all these themes together, it really feels like you're kind of trying to manage a lot of forces in, that are coming in a negative way um, and normalizing that language. So resilience is one of those three goals of this, um, of a lot of this smart city stuff you hear. How do we make resilient cities? So, the, excuse me, that's kind of the Toronto, that's, that's start, trying to set us up here for what's going on in Toronto. Um, the second chapter I'd like to talk about is the technical approach here. Has anybody heard this term moonshot before? This is a favorite of the tech industry. It's basically like, go for these big goals, don't worry too much about how you're gonna get there, but just make big, that very Elon Musk thinking, if I have to pick someone who I think is going for moonshots, that would be 
on that. And so last night, Sidewalk Toronto was out at, I think, the York York Key Neighborhood Association having a conversation. They said, this is our moonshot for cities. Like, we're trying to really go big on how to manage and improve, you know, cities. Um, so a couple of things I think we want to think about, because a lot of these conversations to me are how is this conversation being framed in the first place. Um, I have a real issue, I think, with the idea that we're missing data uh, in terms of solving things related to affordability, environmental issues, sustainability, or resilience. When I think about environmental, I mean, we have a lot of data. We've had a lot of data for a long time. So I think this is one thing that we want to talk to everybody about and say, what additional data do we need to know that we need to maybe reduce car use in, in downtown Toronto? Do we need more data? Like, is data what we're missing? And given that smart cities really do hinge on data, I think that is a central question to find out what is the additional data and what is it going to do for us. Um, particularly with these, with this language, I mean, affordability is data, again, are we missing data to understand what our problems are with affordability? I know that we are missing some housing data, that is true, and I know the federal government's investing in it, but I'm not sure that uh, on a very small site-specific basis if that's, if that's what we're missing. So that's, that's a challenge to this whole model, I think. Um, so can data help? Yes, but the help they offer may be marginal, and what's the cost? And to me, there's a lot of, and this kind of goes back to how this industry came to be, it's, it, you could think of it as market making. Like, is it because, because you can have data, we can now make products and services, and the government or the public sector becomes a market? The very, I mean, that is the history of smart cities. Um, but specifically, if we're looking at, yes, there may be some benefit, but what's the trade-off, or what's the marginal benefit, right? Like, is this, is this worth it? Um, or I think are other questions we need to be asking. Um, so a little like recent history with this, there's a book called Permissionless Innovation. Has anybody heard of this? No, so um, I think the university this man works at is in Virginia. It's a book that came out in 2014. And the crux of it seems to still be living on right now. Like I would say a lot of governments seem stuck in 2014. The thesis of this book is, just get out of the way of the private sector. You gotta let technology do its thing. It's gonna be amazing. Just don't worry about it. We're gonna have good, you know, good economic development. Good jobs are gonna happen. And if government dare get in there, it's gonna shut it down. So not only will it not, you know, it's, it's gonna be serious negative effects if you start to try to regulate the technology industry. Now it's interesting because if you look globally, most people know that this is not the way. Uh, I think in the last year. I have some friends in that, that live in the UK who've been listening to American podcasts on technology and I've talked about what a difference from two years ago because first it was like, oh, Europe's going to get in the way of stuff. And then, maybe, then they're like, oh, maybe Europe's kind of onto something. And now it's like, oh, we really should have done what Europe did. And that's kind of what's known within a lot of the technology circles. And I can speak to more specifics there. But they're getting a handle. Like they have um, much better... Uh, legislation around privacy and some, some new things that have been happening there. But, but really, it's interesting because I think the, 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 um, the sort of belief of getting, don't get in the way of technology is still here, but it's 2014 thinking, which in technology years is a long time ago. So this is, this is one to go back and kind of take a look at if you can get a sense of where some people are coming from with concern about regulating. Um, and then Adam Greenfield wrote a book in 2013 called Against the Smart City and talked a lot about, I think, things that urban planners raise as issues, which are, you know, how does technology get in the way of the community and, and of being neighbors? And, um, and I think this is one of these ethical trade-off discussions of, like, yes, you may be making things better for yourself, but if everybody's making things better for themselves in a city, who's making the city better? Like, who, who does that fall to, right? So that's an interesting um, thing to sort of manage that tension. Um, one thing that is being repeated since day one by the Sidewalk Labs team is that they're not a technology for technology's sake kind of company, and that's not what they're doing with the project. So then I think you kind of have to going back, you know, keep going back to this and say, okay, what is the technology adding? Because some of the things, I don't know if you've seen the proposal, they had a 200 page vision document. It included things like modular housing or, you know, a housing made out of wood. Um, you know, making sure that things were walkable, like a lot of things that I think urbanists can do without any technology. So I think that's where we have to start to parse this a bit better, which is to say, okay, so which of these things require the technology? Because I'm kind of seeing these two narratives not really coming into too much unison, really. 
but I think those are important questions. Um, so the way I think about this deal and others that are coming um, is as procurement. So the <coughs> word for purchasing. So what is the government purchasing? Um, and what does it mean to do ethical pur purchasing or ethical procurement? Um, so one thing I've heard a lot about with this project from others, including Mark Fox, is uh, it's, it's, this is an experiment. There was a piece recently, I think in the Star, which is saying this is an experiment. We should be happy. This is just fun. Some things are going to work. Some things aren't going to work. No big deal. No problem. Manage your expectations. And I think to a degree that's the right attitude. But at the same time, and as Pamela Robinson has been saying about this, like you still need guardrails. You know, like just because you're doing an experiment or you know when, when you do anything um, as an academic uh, piece of work, you have to check. You have to have an ethics review of what's going on. Um, and so yes, experiment. But who? Like we're really talking about experimenting with people now, right? In public spaces. So how do you do that ethically? What does that look like? Um, and it's like anything else. If you have a lab, you still have safety measures that you take, and you make sure that you're going to be, um, you know, adhering to those things. So perhaps this year is talking about what the guardrails are for the experiment, and maybe no experimentation will be happening. Um, but that would be a logical thing. And um, there's a there's a guy named Matthew Caudell who's doing some work at MIT right now to try to figure out how to do this. So I think there are a lot of excited technologists who are also urbanists who do see a lot of promise with, the, with some of the ideas here. But how do you do it ethically is actually becoming one of those major points that people are trying to work through. So he's got some interesting work going on. Um, so I found one really great word in my life is the word draft. Uh, I found this word is really great when you need to bring something somewhere and you know it's not done or maybe it's not perfect or you're going to need help with it. And I'm going to say at this point in time, given that we're how many months into this project are we? Five now? Maybe four or five? Um, everything we've been hearing is that we're going to be co-designing things. We're going to co-design privacy things. We're going to co-design how this is all going to work. And I am a little bit, I would say, concerned that given that this company and Waterfront Toronto both know what we're getting into an experiment here, that nobody's brought draft stuff forward. And I think we need to think about that because this has been a very much of a volley back and forth, the community is saying a lot, and it's not really clear what is going on with this project. And it's completely plausible that this is just one big experiment, but even if, I mean, if I'm running a 50, up to $50 million experiment, I'm going to bring some kind of draft to the table. I think about what I'm thinking about doing. So there's something here that to me is a little bit of a challenge to like get our heads around it. Um, so this isn't about necessarily speculating as to what the project is, but I do think that's a flag that we, that there's nothing brought here, right? Like these are supposed to be people working on these kinds of projects and are fully aware of the environment they're operating in. I would kind of expected some stuff um, around privacy, like as an example. I think there's other stuff to be concerned about, but bringing some draft ideas about privacy would make sense to me. Um, so next about um, the sort of ethical procurement topic, commercializing the public sector. So that question there, what incentive does a vendor have to solve a problem that its product depends on? This is the history of technology and government. Uh, it is, there is entrenched technology that's been purchased by governments for decades now, and it's not even good. And once it gets in, once you get a vendor, a technology vendor into government, it is extremely hard to get them out. And that is sort of one of the upsides and the reason the market is so appealing is because you just keep building stuff into your current product and you know that the government may not have capacity to take it over. So I think we really need to think about if someone's coming in saying they're solving problems, are they solving problems or are they becoming a permanent part of that infrastructure you know, related to that problem? Which of those two things is it? Um, the idea with this app is to, I mean, the way it, the idea of this app is to be able to report if there's an incident of violence, of harassment, of something. So it's an app where you're supposed to be able to, now the initial feature was quite something, that it would disable the flash on your phone. So if you took a picture, the person went, no, you were taking a picture of them, if you can believe that. Um, that was the way it was kind of pitched the first time around. I think that went away. Um, but uh, long story short, um, there's an app that the TTC bought, and it paid $200,000 for a two-year license, $500,000 for a two-year license, $500,000 for a two-year license of this app. And I keep asking for, you know, I keep asking like how many people have downloaded this app, 
um, I think we're up to something in the 2,000 number um, of incidents reported using this app. Um, I bring this up because of a few things related to this, to this app. The first thing is that the company that creates the software for this app is an American company. And they, when you look into them, um, they are basically like got software for like shooting drills in American schools. They support um, school resource officers, so they're allied with the police and schools program, which we know in Toronto that's not something that we're looking to further. Uh, I think we've been having that conversation. And so you, you go up, and it, it, so if you go up into sort of who the vendor is and what their business model is, there's one kind of trap there. Um, of ethics that I think is interesting. I'm not saying you necessarily want to do values-based procurement, but I do find it interesting that when I look at that vendor and I think that's my money, uh, that's, a, that's a business that we're supporting with, with you know, city funds. It's an interesting thing. Um, but the second part of this is that, uh, is that the solution that we're looking for to reduce harassment on the TTC? Because I've had women teach me to just go up to another woman if they're seeing something and basically be like, oh, hey, how are you? Nice to see you today. And to, like, as a human being, disrupt an uncomfortable incident. And that is a social solution. And I think the, this, again, is a sort of uh, fork in the road where you say, is this, is this actually the solution? Like, is, is half a million dollars for the, you know, take a picture and send a text message? Is that the way we want to solve this problem? Or is there other ways we might want to invest that money? So it's just kind of one of these things where someone will always bring you a solution, like technologists will always find a way to bring a product, if that sounds like it's a thing. But I'm not sure that that example is one that um, is great in terms of what we bought, also how much it costs, and you know whether it's value for money is totally questionable. So that's, that's an example of one that's sort of on my mind, um, and I'm watching the days till that license uh, the two years are up. Uh, and the second thing here, what are the ethics of selling products to government that both government and the public don't understand? This is a really big one to me with the Sidewalk Toronto project. Um, I put it this way, which is it's totally normal for the city of Toronto to purchase um, services from urban planning firms. Like there are many urban planning firms in Toronto. We, I, I, I imagine you know that. Um, they have urban planners on staff, as does the city of Toronto. So when the city of Toronto purchases you know, urban planning services, whether it's to design a park or to, to do transportation planning, you have two people sitting at a table, let's just imagine one from a company and one from the city, and they both may be registered urban planners. So when they talk to each other, they share a language and they share a profession and quite possibly a, a, a professional designation. Um, so there's, there's, there's you know, two people who can understand each other properly at the table with each other, which is a good way to have a deal go down. To say that government can negotiate properly with, given sort of where our technical capacity is within government, with some of what I would say, like, and it's not just Sidewalk Labs or anything, but other companies that are software companies, when they come and sit down at the table, do I think, I don't think that we have the same equity in that kind of a relationship, where you have people sitting down where the power dynamic is balanced. And there's an issue here well beyond sort of, how many people in, in government are great technologists versus how many people work at a company, say, like Sidewalk Labs or Google. Um, and there is no, there's no reason for vendors to be forthcoming with what their business plans are beyond the product they're selling government. They don't have to, right? They may be saying, okay, well, we're gonna sell them this thing and then we know we got three other things we might be pitching in the next year or so, but we have no idea. And then we also have no idea about what some of the product capabilities are that some of these technologies that are coming um, may, may have. So there's a concern there, and I think the ethical piece of that is also if you're a vendor, and this has happened many times um, with many products, and you sit down and you realize the person you're selling to does not understand what they're buying, does that stop you? I've seen it not stop people. So is that happening now? I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying with this project, but you know, but generally speaking, how do you manage that sort of imbalance of capacity? And this is a known issue right now with technology procurement. Like this, this is happening all the time, and I, I read it a lot more in the, in the United States, where there just aren't enough people who can manage what a vendor is bringing forward. If they're, if they're responding to a request for a proposal, there's just not enough people within government who can actually look at what's being brought forward to say, is this good or not? Or can they do it in time or not? Or this is just, they just don't have the expertise. 
So this is a known problem. And so to be buying more things when we know we have that problem, it doesn't feel like a great idea. Um, this is something that I've been told many times, is that the public service is too constrained and process paralyzes innovation. I've heard this from a lot of urban planners. Um, I've heard this from people who say, I want to do nice little interventions in neighborhoods, and it, it's really too hard to get that approved. So what do we do, right? Like, so what do we, what, what is the way to manage this problem? And it sounds like the way that's being proposed with things like Sidewalk Toronto is that then you just find people who have some money, and then you see if you can figure it out outside of standard process which for me is not uh, an ideal approach. This even applies to philanthropy. Like I'm personally uncomfortable, whether it's you know for profit or, or in, in any kind of philanthropy way. Once you start saying, well, we're not gonna solve the problem, we're just gonna go around it by finding different funding models, that to me is a very unsustainable approach to, you know, to city building where you maintain control. Um, so instead of going around these ways and saying, well, let's innovate by doing things you know, in an in a exciting commercial fashion, why aren't we going back to our sort of constraints in addressing them? That to me is the logical thing to do within a democratic process to say, okay, well, why is everything so stifled, stifled and how do we fix it? But we're not doing that. We're just sort of routing ourselves around the problem, which I don't see as a, you know, ending well for future. Um, in terms of sidewalk, uh, Toronto, I think the one big um, question, this is something I learned from Nicole Swern, what's on the table for people to decide? I think this, this for me is not clear uh, because I've been hearing things like there's going to be products developed or maybe real estate. Like It's unclear what is happening, but what's extremely unclear is what is on the table because it sounds like everything's on the table, but that does not make any sense for everything to be on the table. Um, what kind of intellectual property do we want to be participating in creating is an ethical question, I think, because that's being tossed around that there's going to be intellectual property created through this project. So are we okay with that? I mean, what are we, what's our role in deciding what products we want to make, you know, as residents here? It's a little bit unclear. It's more than a little bit unclear. Um, so fourth, getting into environmental and human data. Uh, so yeah, this is this is what I said at the beginning. Um, we may need to stop collecting certain types of human data, and now I'm going to get into my thoughts on that. Um, <coughs> data ownership is a big piece of the conversation that's going to be happening here. In the proposal that Sidewalk Labs put forward, they talk a lot about environmental data, so that's data like sh you know shade, sun, energy-related data, rainfall, anything like that, and then also some human data. So behavioral data, right? Like data, this is why we're talking about privacy. And what's being repeated persistently is that they're not commercializing the data, like they're not straight out selling it, because that seems like that was something Ruby wanted to hear. Um, so this is right here. This is what I have. This is what's giving me heartburn about this project. This one very particular thing is the concept that um, it's possible that we are about to begin commodifying human behavior. And when I say that, what I mean is, um, to date, the bulk of the data collection uh, that happens happens when you do it in a commercial sense. Like it's products, you're wearing a Fitbit, you got your phone, like you got all kinds of stuff that are products, which we know companies are collecting reams of data, Facebook, whatever, like all that stuff, products. We have not had a conversation about state sanctioned collection of behavioral data sort of in public spaces. Because that's different. That's you existing in the city and your data being collected. That is not data being collected by a company. And this is why one thing that I'm very, like, uh, my, my ears prick up every time is you have Sidewalk Labs saying that they're going to open data. And immediately we all need to, like, reject that and say it's not their decision to make because it's generally a data owner that decides that they're going to open some data. And we have definitely not had a conversation about the collection of this data, never mind the ownership and management of it. So when I talk about this, I talk about patterns, you know, like if you're walking around in a park, if you're sitting on a bench, if you used a, if, I don't know, if you used one of the um, theaters, something like that. And to be really clear here, this is aggregate data. I'm not suggesting that anybody's going to have a file with your name and your thing and that it's you, 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 you. That's been very clear from day one. There's a point where that doesn't matter anymore. 
Because what we're figuring out is what does aggregate behavioral patterns look like? What do we as human beings do in the day in a public space? What does that look like? And what are the sort of patterns you can start to discern? Um, so there's, this is troubling on two fronts. The first thing is we haven't talked about doing this through government stuff. We definitely didn't talk about what it would mean if we were to then open that data. Because if we were then to open that data, that means that our behavior becomes an open data set which you could then further commercialize. And that to me is terrifying without having a conversation personally. If everybody's cool with it, that's, that's a thing, that's fine. <laughs> but it's not something that I think we want to just assume is okay. Um, the reason this is so very, uh, very much in the front of my mind is I've worked with open data for a while. And open data, I don't know, are you guys familiar with open data as a concept? The idea is generally to make um, data free, available, and in a machine readable format. So like free of charge, free, easy to get, and something that a computer can do something with, to put it you know, in a simple way. Um, open data policy globally is sort of picking up speed. The majority of the data that exists in the world is lists of stuff, is assets. It's, it's assets and it's things. It's not people data. It's not. Uh, there are some open data sets that talk about like survey responses, which you could say is a little bit human sort of behavioral data. Um, but this open data policy was never designed to manage all of the sensor data that's coming online now. So we have one of these cases where, again, in a few short years, um, the policy that was created is out of step with what may be coming online. And um, I keep going back, I wrote a really, really wrong piece about how open data should have been a law because it wasn't really happening. Like a lot of governments were saying they were doing it, but then they weren't. And Frank D'Onofrio, who used to work at the province, was like, no, no, it should not be law. It should be policy. And Frank was right. <laughs> I'm very grateful that it's policy because it means that we um, can you know, iterate. And it's a different process to adjust policy than it is to adjust law. Um, but that's, that's that. So uh, I guess one question I'd be thinking a lot about is there is a lot you can do with the environmental data and a lot of cool ideas, I think, uh, as to how you can apply data from the environment, whether it's water, shade, you know, like that kind of stuff. Could we do a smart city where we just did environmental data? Do we get enough benefit doing a smart city with just environmental data and just forget the human part altogether? Like, just forget it. Just, just don't do that. I would be curious to see if that's something anybody, like, I don't know what the balance is of the interest in, this, in the products and services that are being thought about, but I would like to know could we consider doing it with just environmental data? Um, so this would change the framing of the conversation because the current one is that we need this data and the whole conversation now is about mitigating risks and managing privacy and how are we gonna do all of that so everybody's comfortable with their data being collected and used. There's an alternative frame which is, should we be collecting it in the first place? And this is such a low tech potential solution to some of the problems that might arise because the safest data is the data you never collect. And we may, at some point in the future, be really, really happy that we don't know everything about ourselves and our habits. That's the thing I think about a lot. I'm not sure that knowing uh, like how we operate in the city at all times as groups, as an aggregate, is something that we want to have out. Whether it's held privately or held in an open data set, um, all the same. So here's why. I've thought about this in three particular cases. Uh, data, to my mind, enables recursive behavior. And what I mean by that is once data know, like once how you act is a known thing, it's highly likely that you can use that data to then keep you doing the same thing. I'll give you a few examples of where this works and doesn't. When I think about these um, repeat ordering things, like uh, you're low on X, now I'm gonna automatically order you another shipment of that thing. It's a really hard um, purchasing habit to get out of. You think if you sell products and you know X percent of the population has that thing on auto reorder, how does that shape the landscape um, you know, if, if you want to sell that product? Also, how does that affect pricing when everybody already always knows when you're almost out of something? <coughs> do you, like, do you think it's going to be in a kindly way? Like, we're, oh, you're almost done? Let's put it on sale. You know, like, I'm not sure that that's the <laughs> assumption I would go with. Um, then another related thing here I think a lot about is library books uh, because I read something a few years ago where they were looking at putting the, the footprint of the library where people were like to make it much smaller and then to put a whole bunch of books in a warehouse and then the idea would be that there would be retrieval so it would be a smaller library but all the books would be elsewhere and I thought that was really awful because 
I don't know about you, but when I look for a book, it's usually a book that's three books away from the book that I look for that's a better book, right? And so I worry about that targeting, you know, like that thing where you're just getting what you ask for all the time, because I think that starts to reduce, again, it's like, there's a constant theme here, which is a narrowing and a narrowing of, of choice. Um, and then the last one is the one that I think a lot of people who are critics of smart cities are aware of, which is um, revenue, gener revenue generating behavior. Uh, so if you know the patterns that people follow when they're in a public space, it doesn't take much to consider how you might optimize real estate and services and hours of operation and everything else to just make it that much easier to buy the things. Like this is not super hard to figure out. Um, this happens to a degree already. It's not like there's zero of this, but like how much of this do we want to enable? And I was reading, someone was writing this about airports. Like airports used to be sort of a, a more of a public space. There was this spot you could sit and watch the, the planes take off. It was someone in London and they were saying Heathrow is a mall now. Like it's a mall. The whole place is a mall, which is not at all what it was before, um, whoever, was, whoever had written that. So those things together for me are all connected issues that we may not have to deal with if we sort of cool it on the human data collection. Um, so a couple more things, um, just I think two more sections. Uh, I data source, so that is me as a resident. Um, so Privacy Act and PIPEDA, uh, these are our two federal like governing legislation um, for privacy. The Privacy Act is the one that the government uses, so that's the one that sort of trails down all the way to the city. So the basic tenet of the Privacy Act is that you can only use data for the reason it was collected. And this is an old tenet, but this is basically to say, if I collect information from you in the capacity of you're trying to get a healthcare service, it is the only way I can ever use it is to provide that service to you. I can't hold that data and then get something else from housing <coughs> and start to construct a profile of you. I can't, like the government cannot do that. It is not allowed. And it is sounding more and more and more prudent to me, the <laughs> approach that the government took, um, that that would be an interesting one to consider. What, how, like how do you modernize that? Um, whereas uh, PIPEDA, which is the Personal Information Protection Electronic Documents Act, that's managing the commercial use of data. So that's the one that, um, if you're a business, how does how does a Canadian's information have to be managed? You know, if you're collected lists or something like that. Um, so, so the commercial one, uh, Teresa Scassa is a legal scholar. She's been writing about this. That the commercial one is definitely out of date. Uh, consent is the primary reason. Like, what is can, we all know we ignore the terms of service on the computer, but at least something comes up and you're like, yeah, I should probably read that before you click it. In the city, if you're walking around, what's consent? Like, wh how are we going to be managing that notion of consent? What's your physical trigger to provide consent? Um, and like with video cameras, they usually have to have a sign, but if every step you take and every move you make would maybe. Um, collected, how, like is this going to be managed through an app, whatever, anyway. The point is that that notion of consent in the commercial capacity is a problem, um, so that's out of date. The Privacy Act, surprisingly, is uh, is holding up in some great ways because people may not realize this, but like there's not much known about you in that multifaceted way from the government side. So I've heard government, you know, people who work in the public service extremely frustrated because people are worried about the government knowing too much about them. Meanwhile. They, you know, they say, do, do, do people understand how much Facebook knows about them? You know, and they're worried about us, and we're trying to just get two pieces of, you know, two data sets together, and we can't. But um, this brings up a really interesting um, situation that I think comes back to, this, to the city in a way. Uh, so the Privacy Act, I used to think maybe it would be better if it didn't have all those um, constraints. Like, I remember thinking, well, if I'm a person who lives in this neighborhood, and I have this condition, and I have two kids and I'm looking for, for housing, it would be so much better if they knew all those things because then they, I could get better service delivery. And I still kind of think that might be true, but when I talk to, to people who are really um, aware of how you can abuse, you know, abuse data inside government, you, you think about the opposite version of that and what if people can tell by your behavior is like that you might need a preemptive intervention or that you might be on a watch list because they can see you through four different lenses and you put that data together and you say, you know what, that person's probably going to do something bad soon. So we can either maybe help them or maybe we're going to go and just make sure we're around when they do the bad thing. Like you can take that two ways, 
right? So this for me is a perfect ethics thing where even though I think there may be a lot of benefit in getting rid of those walls, I have been in conversations where I've also said, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I would rather not have the potential downside of the, of the state abuse potential of law enforcement abuse. So I'm just going to say, all right, it's going to be inefficient for me to get the services. I'll live with it. And I think that live with it piece is one of the conversations that we really need to be having. So when is it just not worth it um, when the potential for abuse is too high? So I've been hearing a lot lately about um, residents taking control of their data. I've heard ideas that uh, managing your own data or you should be able to monetize your data or you know, if, if, if someone's making money, you should be making money. So why don't you be in charge of your data? And um, I and uh, Nasma Ahmed, um, she was talking about sort of rejecting this idea of an informed data user and that this idea that you should have to know all these things about how your data is used is a little bit of a bad presumption. Um, and I think that's a great point because there's a way that we could be designing where you should know, you don't have to know. You're safe without managing your, your data. Do we all want to be like logging into our data dashboards being like, okay, so I could tell someone that I like brown shoes and make like five cents. Do I want to do that? I don't know if I want to do that. Like it would be this kind of, how, what's the value? I also think people think the value of the data is higher than it is. Um, but this idea that we now all need to be in charge of our data in our own community, I think is a little bit of a challenge um, to pull off. And I think it makes some assumptions about the time and energy that people have to be doing this. Uh, so I would prefer that we don't go down that track of like suddenly we have to manage all of these things you know, on our own. Um, I think we should figure out a way to design that we don't have to worry about this at all if we never touch our data or talk about our data that we're safe. Um, I think also we need to think about how did we get here? Uh, I think it, a lot has happened in the last few years. I mean, we could say decades, but before it was kind of clear, like if you had a phone number, you're in the phone book. I don't know if people remember, like, does everybody here know that that was a thing? Like you would get a phone number and then you would be in the phone book like with your name and address, which may seem really not a great on privacy, but it was manageable. Um, now you get a phone and you can be tracked by the government and the police. <laughs> like, I just don't, I'm not sure that that transition was clear when that happened. Uh, I don't think we understand that we've been carrying sensors around since we've had cell phones. I mean, that's really, this is the most, like as far as the sensors that are collecting things go, your phone is, is doing a lot of work. Um, and I think that there's enough people beginning to realize that this is not, a lot of what's being collected is not what people signed up for. And um, I do think we need to understand that we can push back against what's collected or how long it's kept or retained. Um, we also don't talk enough about data deletion as part of policies that people can have. A lot of companies, I don't know if you've ever got an email where they say it's been five years since you've talked to us, so we're deleting your file. When I get one of those, I'm like, yes. Um, but five years is a long time, right? So like maybe it doesn't have to be five years. Uh, and in, in places that have very proactive data policies, no one wants to hold data, it's a liability. Like in the government side of life, you don't want it for the most part, right? So. It's kind of, um, I, think, I think we all need to kind of come back together and say, what are we comfortable with? What don't we want to have collected or stored? And a um, and, uh, final thought on this, um, there's a woman named Ellie Marshall who said something at the, what, the data literacy conference that happened recently in Ontario. Um, she's maybe not there, but was talking about how this whole, like protect yourself online. Like it's like, it's on you. Like if you don't do these things, it's your fault, right? Like this whole notion that, there should be that that we have to be on the defensive is not empowering at all. Like and, and what she was talking about is how do we rebuild technology so it supports the life we want to have online? Like we should what 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 why are we defensive? Why aren't we being proactively engaged in creating the kind of policy and the kind of um, support for like our activities? Um, so that's a possible way forward that we should be thinking about and it's all possible. Um, and the last thing I, I just I think about this with like the dark end game you know possibility if, if you're trying to find ways to make money like it, it's like the ads I see for people who will do drug testing like if you're in if you're in a bad space and you need to make money maybe you'll just go do a drug test like if, if you're in a bad space and maybe you need money what data are you gonna sell and whose data is worth money like who what if you're not moving a lot what what if you don't generate a lot of activities, so then you don't get a lot of money for your data. So then you're what, like a lower case of data 
you know, data generating person in our society. So I think, I think uh, there's a lot of conversation right now about nationalizing our data or how do we monetize our data. And again, like my instinct is to go to the, maybe we don't want to do that with human data. Um, yeah, we talked about deletion. So two more things, um, data driven cities, which data? This is a bit of a slog, but I'm going to just read it to you. This is from the Sidewalk Toronto proposal, because <clears throat> I don't like taking quotes out of context, but this is from their vision document. So it says, building new neighborhoods from the internet up is a remarkable opportunity to embed emerging digital capabilities into core infrastructure from the start. Physical spaces like buildings, streets, and parks can be designed for the opportunities that technology present, rather than forced to retrofit new advances very slowly and at great cost. By merging the physical and the digital into a neighborhood's foundation, people are empowered with the tools to adapt to future problems no one can anticipate. Such a place quickly becomes a living laboratory for urban innovation. Given the speed of technological change, cities will only meet their growth challenges if they support innovation, not right now, but 10, 20, and 50 years ahead. Okay, so bold is mine. To do so requires designing for radical flexibility, enabling the best ideas to be refined in real time and creating a cycle of ongoing improvement driven by the feedback of residents and the energy of entrepreneurs rather than prescribed by planners and designers. So residents and entrepreneurs rather than planners and designers. That really stuck out to me. Um, how many of you have been to a, uh, a um, neighborhood planning meeting? <laughs> Good times, huh? <laughs> so maybe we'll just skip to here. Um, who in the community has the power and the privilege to engage in those meetings, right? So if we're starting to get into this thing where it's going to be the individuals are going to be the ones designing the neighborhood, um, which, which individuals are going to be doing that? and what business ends are going to be being met by doing this. So I, I feel that this idea that we're sort of skipping over the role of professionals, of institutions, the public service, all the people who study urban planning, um, it's part of their role to make sure that the cities are more for everyone and that you don't have to be involved in them for them to work for you. That's supposed to be the idea. And I think this is opening up an interesting conversation because it's a little bit counterintuitive, but I know this from public consultation. You open a public meeting and 200 people come in and they all tell you something, it doesn't mean you do what they say. It doesn't mean they're in charge of what they're saying. And this is where sometimes people forget that cities have power to do things and planners and other people who know what they're doing and that's what they spend their time working on. And so we have to sort of figure out what's the right place for the planners in the city to define and what's the right place for the residents and other individuals to, to you know, to, to collaborate and co-design. But I think we don't want to just throw out, and I'm not suggesting that the saying to totally throw it out, but to mess with that balance is it has impacts. And um, there's an inefficiency, I think, obviously, to some of the things you have to plan in cities. They're not going to be inefficient. Some things are really expensive, and they don't you know, assign the same value to, to every person who's going to use them. Um, John Loring was um, sharing this idea as well that there's a lot of observational information that's not like the kind of data you would collect from sensors. It's the kind of data you would collect by sitting on a bench and watching people and seeing how they use the space. And it may be different sometimes, or maybe the same, or it may be really difficult to put in a data set. Um, and that kind of messiness is, is wonderful. And this you hear this all the time from people who know urban planning. Like a lot of what's beautiful in the way we live together is chaotic, messy, changing a lot. Like it's, it's not going to be always a synthesized, like um, data-driven kind of environment. Um, and so this point here that um, I, I shared the, the presentation online and um, that called Stuart Bailey, he, he threw this, work, this term out. He said, there's multiple concurrent truths for data. And I think this is really true, that this is not a binary, like, is this a good idea or a bad idea? It's not. It's just when you start doing things in the data-driven smart city way, what do you lose, right? So what are the trade-offs and which way do we want to go? Uh, there's a lot of ways to use data and the environmental data, um, I think, that are really, really interesting. So a few considerations sort of as an outro here as to what we're going to be doing with this project um, and maybe some things to consider that don't seem to be in the plans. A lot of the talk about the products and services that might come out of this seem to be like they would be proprietary. 
And it feels um, counterintuitive to be building proprietary products, but maybe in cities we should be building things that can be shared within cities, like open source. Not to say everything has to be open source, but software actually can scale to a degree. You can build something in Toronto and share a lot of it with Montreal or with Ottawa or something like that. So is more proprietary products what we need? Um, there's a lot of reason for some of the data that's being collected maybe just to be held within government and not be shared and not be public. Like maybe we want to keep some of the data with the people who have an ethical commitment to apply it to public service delivery and maybe not commercialize it. Um, the third thing I think is at the end of this project it sounds like we're going to get one option which is a yes no. It also seems like that's not sort of in um, what I would call progressive procurement ideas right now, you kind of better to see a few options. So how could we consider other ways of doing this? Because we're going to get one way, but how could we look at other ways? The envi environmental data thing we talked about. Um, how do we make sure that we're just making safe spaces for people to exist in? And this gets back to the human data piece and the scale and share we talked about. And uh, this, this idea of sort of challenging the political digital consensus, um, I bring this up because did anybody see recently, uh, I think it was a, there was something on the front page about uh, universal health care not being like, I think um, Trudeau was getting in trouble for not supporting an idea for like a universal program. I'm not sure if it was health care or if it was child care. Anybody? Pharmacare. Pharmacare, thank you. Um, and and this is to bring it way up before, before I finish, is, is that universal programs uh, may be much more efficient than program programs. Because we're doing all these things where we're getting tons of data, we're trying to assign it to different people and understand how all these like specifics, and it's kind of like versions of means testing in some ways, like to make sure we have lots of data and we can line it up to different populations. Um, and the more that we get into using data and tools and data, 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 we're kind of getting away from considering universal programs, which can be a lot more efficient if you're not doing all of that means testing work or all of that like constant data analysis, dashboards, all of this stuff. So I just think it's something worth considering that um, we may not want to be going down this track so much. We may want to say, like, is there is universal program something we need to talk about more? Because the more we do digital stuff, the further that one seems to fall off the table as an option, um, which is interesting because I actually think that one may be more efficient. Um, so that's that, and I think that's a consideration, you know, as we're heading into an election year to think about how how we do or don't need this kind of data and this kind of an approach to city building. So I think that is it. Yeah, that's all. Mm -hmm. Thanks.